say we're shifting to a very differing topic now. Uh, please grab your lunch in front of your computer and in, in front of your screen and stay with us. It's a very important topic. It actually is one of the most important uh, field where digital rights is under research or at least not uh, doesn't get enough in attention from the digital rights field. Um, and it's a shame because a lot of fundamental rights violations are happening almost on a on a quasi daily basis at the borders of Europe, but also on European territory. And it concerns people on the move um, and everybody that deserve uh, their migration rights to be uh, respected by the European Union. And it, it has a lot of interconnection with data protection and privacy consideration. Um, and for uh, this panel, uh, it's a very specific one. It's the EDPS Civil Society Summit. It's kind of a tradition in Privacy Camp for some years that we co-organized this panel with uh, EDPS, the European Data Protection Supervisor, and we're super happy that it continues uh, this year as well. It's very an important time where we can exchange with the institution and share our civil society point of view and also get to understand where the institutions uh, are standing on certain issues and this year we, we picked this topic and we are very much looking forward for this for this uh, discussion I would like to um, invite the moderator who kindly agreed to uh, to discuss and and moderate the discussion today uh, Laurence Meyer. Uh, who is the Racial and Social Justice Lead from Digital Freedom Fund. Thank you so much, Laurence. I will let you introduce the topic further and also the speakers, uh, and don't hesitate if you need any support. Have a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Um, as Chloe said, I'm Laurence Meyer. I'm the Racial and Social Justice Lead at uh, Digital Freedom Fund. Um, I see some of the panelists already are uh, in place. I will invite... Uh, yeah, exactly. Alina and Teresa are also <laughs> are arriving, so that is great. Um, so thank you all so much for being there uh, to discuss, um, as Chloe said, this really central topic when we talk about like fundamental rights and people uh, on the move. Uh, we can't ignore the, the impact that the use of digital tools have on uh, potential infringement of their rights. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction of all the panelists. Uh, I'm just apologizing in advance if I mispronounce your name and uh, for uh, the shortness of the presentation. Um, first on my list is uh, Wojciech uh, Vivorowski. Uh, um, he is the European Data Protection Supervisor since December uh, 2019 and uh, that for a term of five years. Dr. Teresa Quintel is a lecturer at the Maastricht uh, European Centre on Privacy and Cyber Security, and uh, she joined uh, the centre in July 2021. Her th thesis looked at, uh, and this is the title, Managing Migration Flows by Processing Personal Data Within the Adequate Data Protection Instrument. Alina Smith uh, is Deputy Director at the Platform of International Cooperation on Undocumented Migrants. Uh, she joined PICOM, PICOM, I don't know how <laughs> you pronounce it, uh, in 2015. And uh, until 2021, uh, she led PICOM's advocacy on access to healthcare and access to justice for undocumented pe people. And uh, last but not least, uh, Sarah Shanda. Uh, who leads Edris policy work on a artificial intelligence and uh, specifically the EU's AI regulation work that is happening right now. Uh, she also works on issues of discrimination in a digital context, uh, migration-related technologies, and works on the process that I know a bit about uh, of uh, decolonizing the digital rights field alongside uh, Digital Freedom Fund, so the organization I uh, work for. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'll obviously invite also the, the people in the audience to share questions, remarks, reactions uh, in the chat. And if, uh, yeah, if at some point you also want, mostly toward the end of the discussion, to just join the discussion with like uh, also open camera, please feel free to do so. Um, we have an hour, 
yeah, we have a bit less than an hour uh, to discuss a topic that would uh, deserve much more time. <laughs> so we'll try to just um, give it justice. Um, and I'll begin with this really clear uh, fact uh, that the EU, the European Union, has the deadliest border in the world. So according to the International Organization for Migration, uh, it we've lost around 23,000 uh, people that were recording uh, either missing or dead in the Mediterranean since 2014. Uh, and we know that uh, the use of digital tools plays uh, a role in increasing the dangerousness of borders for people on the move. So my first question uh, is related to data protection, obviously, because we know that one of the tools uh, that happens to <laughs> make it more dangerous to cross borders uh, for some people uh, are, among other things, the data collection and the multiplication of databases. Alina uh, Smith and uh, Wojciech uh, Vivorowski, uh, how would you say or how do you see the impacts of data collection and exchange on the rights uh, of people on, on the move, firstly? And would you say that data protection laws in the EU at this stage have the potential to enhance the human rights protection and the safety uh, for people on the move. So I'm directing that to firstly Alina and then uh, uh, Alina Smith and then like uh, Wojciech uh, Vivorowski, but obviously Sarah, Shanda and Teresa Quintel, feel free to add on to that uh, afterward. The floor is yours, uh, Mr. Vivorowski. So should I then start? So let me first of all welcome all of you and uh, say that uh, this, this is another time when I take part in the uh, Privacy Camp, which I uh, recognize as one of the most important conferences, and actually starting the year with Privacy Camp is an important thing for me. That's something that you expect to, to hear from somebody who is uh, a guest and who somehow uh, at the same time is the organizer of this uh, meeting and this uh, um, forum that is always uh, in, the, in the middle of the Privacy Camp. Uh, but uh, uh, let me say also quite frankly uh, at the beginning that while uh, the discussion with the uh, NGOs, uh, with the specialists, with academics uh, dealing with human rights is an important part of our job and it's opening uh, us eyes on what's going on in the world, this is not an easy discussion. And I'm not going to say that uh, I came here in order to ask you for help to deal with the uh, problem which is uh, well understood uh, and all the data protection authorities uh, in the world are definitely in favor of uh, reducing the uh, burden which is put on the migrants uh, uh, and to, that we have the perfect law to deal with it, but we have the bad uh, execution. This is what we often hear and what we sometimes expect from the data protection commissioners. And uh, when we decided that the, this is going to be the subject of this year's summit, uh, I was really in favor, but I was in favor because this is one of the most difficult subjects that we are dealing with, not from the technical point of view, not from the organizational point of view even. It's not that difficult to understand, but it's extremely difficult to convince the people and also the authorities in the member states and authorities on the European level, that here we have the real problem. Because uh, the problem that is seen as far as the um, uh, as migrants are concerned, that's first of all the situation, the, 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 the accidents, the uh, problems to, uh, to, to keep them uh, alive, actually, to, uh, throughout their uh, travel to Europe, the problems with the camps, the problem with the organization of the uh, administration ready for the migrants, but not really the technical use of the data and the purpose for, use the, for which the data is used. In fact, uh, this is seen as a kind of solution to the problems which are visible. 
So in this sense, when the data protection authorities start to say that we have a problem with the purpose limitation, for example, we got a big pushback from many sides, also from this, from some of the NGOs, who say, come on, this is how we fight with the problem. This is how we try to organize the things. And you are trying to give these to tools away from us. So I would say that uh, the all interoperability exercise that is done at the moment is actually done in order to solve the problem. Uh, and our role as a data protection commissioners is to say that the solution is not the real, the, well, the, the solution is not to stop migration. The solution is not to get rid of these people. The solution is not to transport these people. The, the solution is to understand that they are the people and to understand that you are not crossing the data and you are not crossing the information. You are simply crossing the people. You are trying to cross the information about the people so the human dignity is really at stake. So uh, when we think why the data protection issues are important in this, uh, uh, in this subject, I would start from the general assumption. All the tools that are prepared are prepared in the good, with the goodwill. The problem is that they are not respecting the main principles that have been done in the data protection law by purpose. Uh, there was a reason to do that. And the purpose limitation, minimization, the quality of the data, the legality, transparency of the processing, this is all the things which are the principles of data protection. And that were, they were put it into the European law, also in the charter as the right to the personal uh, data protection, because we know that in such of the situations where we have a problem, we have a tendency to solve it uh, simply breaking the rights of the people and uh, trying to uh, secure their lives, but not secure their dignity. So that, that would be the, the, the initial point of the discussion on the use of different large-scale databases, but also all different uh, uh, data that is coming directly from the, from the migrants. And in the end, the, 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 the last topic that uh, I would uh, put in is the problem that some of the solutions which we offer generally in data protection uh, world may not work with migrants. And one of these uh, is the consent. The consent is uh, for many people, not with the good reasons, the queen of the legal uh, of the legal basis for data processing. That's definitely not true with the migrants. Bearing in mind the fact that most of the people who are at the borders and try to cross the borders are ready to consent for anything to get out of the situation they are at the very moment. So we have to use the principles of data protection but we have to use them in the uh, reasonable way, re bearing in mind that we are not protecting the data, but protecting the people. Thank you very much. And also to put the question of how we define consent in a, con in a context where uh, there is no real alternatives. Uh, Alina, what is your, what is your take on um, how much the, data protection laws right now are protecting the people on the move and uh, the impact of the data collection and data exchange on their rights. Thanks a lot, Laurence. Um, I mean, I think, I, think it's, I think it's striking that just the term data collection, you know, data collection, that sounds so innocuous, doesn't it? Uh, sounds super banal, you know, data collection, data processing. And I think the, the banality and kind of the, um, yeah, the boringness in a way of that term just masks how incredibly invasive um, this, uh, the processing of personal data can be in the context of migration. And also just the enormous consequences for individuals of the ways in which, and as we were just hearing, the purposes for which data gets processed in the migration context. So I guess in terms of, I mean, maybe just starting out talking about the harms, like let's talk about the harms of this thing that sounds so innocuous. Um, <clears throat> I think the first harm that we've seen is just, um, 
in terms of the ways in which this happens in the purposes is this reinforcement of this idea of people who are not from here, not from Europe, is essentially being framed as risks that need to be monitored, that need to be checked, that need to be screened. Um, so that's the default. Um, and so, of course, this is profoundly discriminatory <clears throat> and stigmatizing. Um, and so, you know, we heard it just a moment ago about these um, interoperable systems. <clears throat> Again, a very mind-numbingly dull term, but what does that actually mean? Um, it means that um, even outside of the borders, this, these processes of, of surveillance and checks are happening. So your cousins who want to come to your wedding, uh, who are wanting to apply for a visa or maybe for travel authorization under the new system this year, ETS, well, there's already a screening process. They are putting their personal information a whole raft of personal information into either the visa information system, the uh, the travel authorization system, ETS. And where is that going? Well, that's going into an immense um, repository that can hold up to 300 million records. Um, can we even get our minds around the size of that? Um, and being linked up with other databases that are part of this overarching system that have nothing to do with visas and nothing to do with travel authorizations that have, you know, maybe have to do with um, criminal records that have to do with asylum applications. Um, they're being linked up with Interpol, Interpol databases, Europol databases. Um, and the intention, of course, is to screen people for migration, health and security risks. Um, that's that. So. That so I think this kind of takes me to the the second kind of harm in a sense is is the ways in which the purposes for which personal data is processed in the immigration context creates a pervasive web of surveillance and um, and uh, and um, suspicion. Um, and again, it goes far beyond our borders, but of course it includes our borders, but it also includes even in our communities. So that, for example, in the Netherlands, you get stopped by a police, a police officer, that police officer on their app, on their mobile phone, can immediately tell if you're undocumented. So that encounter goes from whatever it started out as to a potential immigration enforcement encounter. And not only do you face as an individual, you know, in the context of an encounter that already may be fraught, depending on who you are, you now face potential deportation. So, again, where this is happening, it's it's happening um, in a very pervasive way. I mean, even again, beyond law enforcement, you know, in Germany, for example, if you're an undocumented person who wants to see a health professional, um, the authority that gives you the possibility of getting reimbursed for that treatment um, has an obligation to share your data with the immigration authorities. So immigration authorities and the processing of data for that purpose then becomes pervasive even in the health system. So we just see the tentacles of this reaching far and wide. And I think the harms of that are really hard to even articulate. Um, and just the kind of oppressiveness of that web, um, which is obviously quite invisible, um, but again has enormous implications for individuals, um, and starts with the with the baseline that they they are they are threats. Um, and just just to briefly just recall that these whole interoperable systems, so these different systems um, that are are now interconnected. Well, why are they interconnected? Um, the justification is that, well, we need to support efforts to better tackle well, serious threats like terrorism and, oh, yes, immigration, uh, irregular migration, as if those two things were coextensive. So, again, reinforcing um, this, this presumption that all foreigners, because we're speaking of all foreigners, these databases, this big uh, central repository, only includes the personal data of non-Europeans. So I think those are the harms we're talking about, um, even before talking about surveillance technology literally at borders and in the Mediterranean and so on. And um, and so in terms of our, our rules working, I think what we heard is exactly right. We have, I mean, Europe, you know, is a standard bearer globally in terms of data protection, but what we see is the circumventing, the skirting on purpose, as we heard, of those very robust rules 
um, in the migration context. So the interoperability rules passing one year after uh, the GDPR, um, presenting a host of challenges around purpose limitation, as we've just heard, um, but justified presumably because of the nature of the threat. Um, and so I think we have the tools. Um, we just, we're not enforcing them equally. Um, we're not enforcing them equally. Um, and of course, as we already heard, the bigger challenge, of course, is not the technical side of this, but of course, the, the broader narrative and, and accepted kind of um, accepted narrative that actually this technology is not creating discrimination, it's not creating problems, it's providing solutions, but it's providing solutions to an understanding of migration that itself is something we need to unpack carefully together, maybe in another session. Yeah, maybe in another session that we can try and start now. And um, that leads me somehow to my uh, to my next question that is more addressed to Sarah Chanda and Teresa Quintel, but obviously everyone is welcome to uh, join the conversation uh, among the panelists. Um, obviously, one of the barriers is the way we frame the problem, right? Uh, and that's uh, what uh, Alina Smith, uh, both Alina Smith and uh, Wojciech Vivorski were addressing uh, in the um, introductory uh, uh, introductory talk. Sorry for that. <laughs> I guess that's the word that is coming, going to come. Um, but what other barriers, or do you want to expand on that barrier or other barriers that actually prevent uh, a full, vigorous, uh, impactful enforcement of human rights for uh, people on the move, specifically when we talk about data collection or use of AI um, in this context? Sarah, perhaps you want to begin, and then Teresa... Uh, Quintel, you could, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Laurence, and I can only say thank you for all of the interventions so far. I definitely think that we have to take this concept further that is it that we're here to interrogate whether data protection can or cannot help us in the context of EU migration policies, which are criminalizing people, surveilling people, monitoring people on the move, or is it that, that such, we have to accept to some degree that such principles, such policies have been developed by design uh, in contravention to data protection principles, but not only in contravention to basic human dignity, as we've heard of people on the move, basic fundamental rights. And I think more and more from the, the previous two interventions, we can see it's the latter. So then what it is, uh, what is it should we be doing about that once we accept this principle? Um, I would like to speak a little bit more about uh, the expansion of EU migration databases and expand on what Alina has said, but then also to speak to some of the barriers in answer to your question about how um, the use of surveillance technologies have been placed on top of that uh, problem, on top of that framework, and what, what does that mean for people on the move? Um, so Alina's already really eloquently talked about the interoperability framework, which is great, so I don't have to. But I think in addition to that, we would need to really have a good um, understanding as the data protection community, as the digital rights community, of what it is that some of these databases are doing. So in addition to uh, Visa Information System, in addition to ETS, we also have... Uh, um, databases such as Eurodac, which are also expanding a number of very worrying trends when it comes to the data of people in the move. Some of them include, for example, entrenching this link between movement and criminality, which we see being done ideologically, but we're also seeing embedded in the legal framework by focusing on returns or deportations, to use framing particularly uh, well such movements are justifying the exchange, more and more exchange of data between migration authorities and uh, law enforcement authorities and also authorities in third countries to facilitate deportations. We're also seeing in the context of Eurodac, which is the database uh, with information on asylum seekers and irregular migrants, 
um, being proposed to involve the collection of biometric data from children as long as as young as six. We also see that um, there is a shift towards the co collection of more categories of sensitive data from people on the move, asylum seekers, including their facial images. This is despite the fact that these databases already include um, invasive data such as fingerprints, sensitive data such as fingerprints. And we also see that with respect to these or the comments that we've already heard when it comes to consent, a foundational principle in the data protection world, people subject to this database almost have no say, no real say in the retrieval of the data from them. So a far cry from principles of consent of the data set, uh, the giver. And conversations have already been going in the EU framework about whether and how acceptable it could be to use force to ensure the taking of people's biometric data. So in essence, in addition to all of what we've we've heard from Alina, what we're seeing is this expansion of existing databases that we already have, potentially expanding the extent to which we can consider them tools of violence against people, against children also. And we're seeing this like creation of a surveillance sort of superstructure of information of all people on the move who happen to be non-EU nationals. Uh, from a race perspective, who are these people? They are black and brown people across the world. This is something that simply by understanding from a data protection perspective is important, from a fundamental rights perspective is important, but it's also a question of discrimination, as Alina said, and racial justice. Why are we happy with this creation of this superstructure against racialized people across the world? Second, my second point is we're also seeing the increased interest of policymakers in this notion of artificial intelligence uh, in the context of migration control. So more and more we're seeing authorities, policymakers endorsing the development, the testing, the deployment of AI systems on people on the move, people that are already discriminated against, already marginalized and have been systematically prevented from accessing their rights. Um, iBorder Control is a famous example where many people are aware of where AI lie detectors were trialed on people in the course of their visa application process. Um, but there have been many, many more examples of this and many, many more examples in production, in development, particularly under the EU Horizon 2020 research program. So basically in, in its attempt to ensure trustworthy uh, AI and to regulate to ensure trustworthy AI. We've seen that the EU has proposed this AI regulation and in the course of that, what he has done is classified some uses of artificial intelligence in the migration context as high risk. Uh, what this means is that uh, developers of such high risk technologies have to undergo a series of technical checks to make sure the data quality is strong, to make sure that the use of such technologies is transparent. Adri's been investigating this proposal with a coalition of digital rights and migrant rights organizations. And we think that there are a number of main flaws in that proposal. And this could be one of the things that if we are concerned about this, we could look to change. The first, Alina has already talked about risk assessments. Um, to score individuals for risks of threats of security, illegality, health risks, foundationally discriminatory and foundationally in contravention to principles of purpose limitation and other data protection principles, consent, et cetera. We think that the more needs to be done. These are not systems are not just high risk, but actually need to be prohibited. And we need to not endorse this uh, wholly uh, non-consensual and discriminatory use of risk assessment systems as surveillance technologies, as discriminatory technologies against people on the move. The second issue is that the EU's AI proposal has a loophole in it for AI systems that are used in the course of large scale IT databases. So if we're using AI in the context of Eurodac or uh, another large scale database, the proposal pretty much provides a loophole for those systems so that the rules in the proposed AI legislation do not apply. Obviously, this is a vast um, flaw in the potential legislation. And if we're talking about not creating a second class of data protection, a second class of fundamental rights for people simply by the nature of the fact that they are moving, that they are migrants, that they are non-white, this is something that we really need to attack to ensure the accountability of EU institutions. 
And then lastly, the, and, and this is where I'll stop, there are a number of flaws in the legislative proposal in terms of the types of technologies that these um, that are being currently unregulated. So far in the legislative proposal on AI, there is no mention of the use of predictive analytic systems. To, and, would we, and this is particularly worrying because we've seen some examples of such systems being used in even to facilitate the interdiction of votes, of course, completely undermining the right to asylum and the principle of non refoulement. This will be a particularly interesting question because often this is not identifiable data. This is not data about one particular person. It's a, uh, data about people on their aggregate. How do we feel about this as a data protection community, as a digital rights community, and what resources and mechanisms do we have to contest this that aren't based on personally identifiable data, but big data generally, non-identifiable data? The second point that, that we don't see in the AI regulation is that we see mass surveillance technologies being used at the border, but that don't rely on that identification of people, but rather simply the detection of whether a human is there. Of course, we've seen this is being developed for the purposes of identifying people, stopping people at the border and pushing back. Um, the Horizon 2020 fold-out program is one of them. And this is, again, another question about the, the centrality of the concept of identification in data protection law. If we center everything on that, then we miss these broader uses of analytic AI technology, which are still being used in the course of the surveillance mechanism, the surveillance industrial complex that we have currently at EU borders. How we're going to address that, I think, is a key question. But we necessarily need the data protection community, we necessarily the digital rights community to take hold of them if we're going to address them. I'll stop there. Thank you very much for all these um, interventions and this very important point. Um, I think I will rather speak to about uh, the more practical issues of interoperability and the connection of all these large scale inform information systems. So when we speak about migrants and asylum seekers in the framework of EU large scale databases and their interoperability, I see the biggest limitation or the biggest barrier for those people and the complexity and the vagueness of the system and the difficulty to, to understand uh, how one's personal data is stored in the databases uh, and how they are being connected. And even, I mean, even people working in this topic since many years have difficulties understanding the system and the foreseeability requirement is basically non-existent where People do not understand the, the system and cannot understand what is happening the, to their personal data. And then this will, of course, uh, affect how they can exercise their rights uh, to understand uh, how the processing in the system works. Because each database, so Alina already explained a bit that you have uh, different databases. Some of them are already operational. Some of them are uh, being developed right now, and then they are supposed to be interconnected. And each database has particular provisions for the exercise of data subject rights. The interoperability uh, regulations add yet, an, yet other provisions. And in some cases, those provisions are very incoherent and it's difficult to, to understand uh, this highly technical setup of different databases, uh, of different systems uh, that refer to other laws that you also have to then read. So if you're not a lawyer, and uh, best case scenario would be an EU data protection lawyer specialized in large scale information system, it will take you days or weeks to understand this. You also have to, of course, understand the law. You have to understand the, how the law is written. And it will take you a lot of time to understand the system uh, whom to contact in order to exercise your rights, what will happen to your data. Uh, and of course, then we also have to look at additional actors that are processing personal data in the system, especially if we, were, uh, if we look at uh, EU agencies such as uh, Frontex or Europe, it's becoming even more difficult that there are different levels, different layers of actors and authorities that have access to the, the systems uh, because the procedures uh, differ, the different uh, to the ones that apply when you're contacting national authorities to exercise your rights. Um, and with regard to Europol, what we've seen in the very recent part, past is that 
the trend of how they are processing the, the personal data is very worrying. Uh, and I wouldn't be very sure in respect of their being uh, processing and data protection rules applied in a very fair and lawful manner. Uh, and if we look at Frontex, the agency was initially supposed to have only an assisting role uh, to the member state authorities and is now developing into some kind of an information hub, uh, a bit like Europol. And the pro problem uh, with regard to Frontex is that their data protection office consists of basically two people. If not even Europol are managing their data in a correct manner, how will Frontex which now has to oversee not only staff and the, the, the additional standing corps, but also the data it receives from the member states, the data in the, in the databases, uh, some of which they are supposed to manage and be the controller of, uh, then manage to actually comply with all the rules that they should. And finally, for individuals, it will be very difficult to understand um, how to contact supervisory authorities in the member states. Of course, that is not the case in all countries. Uh, in some countries, uh, supervisory authorities reply to requests in a reasonable time frame, but it really depends on the country where you're submitting your request. So it could be a country like Germany, where each federal state has a different uh, DPA, and obviously it's better always to speak the language to understand the laws. Um, so it will be extremely burdensome to exercise your rights in this interoperable system. And if we look at the criminalization of migrants, uh, third country nationals, I see another limitation or barrier in, uh, especially in data protection law, for uh, which is uh, that where data protection rules that should only apply in the, in the criminal law enforcement context, suddenly are being applied in the migration context. And those rules leave much more leeway uh, to the authorities, for example, to restrict data subject rights or uh, to transfer personal data to third countries. So, for example, the countries where uh, these individuals come from, and this could have serious repercussions when their, their personal data are being shared with their, the authorities in their home countries. And in the framework of my PhD, I contacted several border guards or coast guards, border police, in order to ask in what kind of situations they apply these law enforcement data protection rules. And they all replied uh, that the rules are being applied as soon as there's some suspicion of crime. And in this criminalization of migration context, this means as soon as someone is crossing the border, we call it irregularly, which is not an illegal crossing, but then does not, for example, apply for asylum, this could then lead to the application of the much more lenient rules uh, under which uh, authorities can also restrict data subject rights much more easily. And this transparency principle that generally exists under data protection law, uh, what Alina also mentioned, uh, does not have to be respected anymore in the same way. So. This is where I see the practical barriers for individuals whose personal data are being stored and processed in those databases. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I had thoughts when uh, Sarah, you were speaking about the fact that there is like a control of uh, people as a group. Uh, as communities, and it's also like a way of uh, aggregating data that might not also um, lean into the more privacy-centered way of um, conceiving uh, data protection. And also when we talk about access to justice, and I think that's uh, a lot of what you were referring to as well, uh, Teresa, the practical barriers to access rights when you are in a, in a specific position. Um, that is something that people on the move know daily, right? They have this experience daily. Uh, uh, Alina, you spoke about it quite eloquently. It's something that is part of like their reality in uh, in member states uh, of the European Union. And um, weirdly enough, though, we don't see them uh, often on the forefront when it comes to. Uh, doing advocacy work when it comes to actually leading 
uh, strategic litigation effort. We don't see them uh, uh, also in key positions or in key places to talk with uh, relevant uh, authorities. And I was wondering how do you as organizations, as institutions work with include uh, people on the move and their expertise and not only their experience in the way you uh, uh, you talk and you work on those uh, subjects. Um, as we didn't uh, hear, the, you're the first person we heard and we haven't heard uh, you since then. I'll just invite perhaps uh, um, the data protection uh, supervisor, uh, Mr. Vivorowski, uh, to uh, begin with that. Okay, as an authority that uh, has to work uh, according to the law, according to the rules which uh, have been established by the, the European Union, and uh, as uh, uh, the authority, which is not the supra-European authority in data protection, but uh, the one that is uh, supervising only the European institutions, bodies and agencies, including those working on the uh, migrant issues and uh, the border issues, uh, we do not have... Uh, the practical oversight over the whole pro uh, uh, problem. We have to do it together with the data protection authorities of the member states. And it also means that we do not have the uh, permanent uh, contact with the representatives uh, of the people of, on the move. And to be frank, one of the main reasons uh, for which we decided that this topic is an interesting topic for the EDPS uh, was to ask uh, you, as those who have the experience in this field, where should we look this first hand, let's say, uh, the, 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 the practical experiences? Because we at the moment see them when we do inspections. So we are actually inspecting one side of the story, not having any co concrete case against that usually, because the, the people are not uh, uh, complaining directly to the EDPS. So we are, we, we see how organized it is from the side of the institution which is taking part in it. And let me at this moment uh, address something which has been already addressed before by Alina, uh, but uh, then later on was, uh, was uh, developed uh, by Teresa. The problem of the resource which we are uh, inspecting. That's not that easy that we have one huge database of millions, uh, billions or trillions uh, of the records and the uh, and the, um, the values. No, we do have actually the ecosystem of different sources of information, an ecosystem of different resources, which are managed by different uh, uh, authorities. So actually, the whole concept of interoperability is good for those who are introducing it because it. Uh, Require, it, it allows to have an access to the data which is stored in different places and managed by different controllers. But at the same time, it means that the possibility to oversight the whole ecosystem does not exist. Because being the data protection commissioner, I have the right to, to, uh, to uh, check from both sides the connections, the, the inter, the, 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 this interoperable databases and interoperable large resources have with themselves, but not necessarily with the data which is in the national uh, capacities, which is in the national resources. So uh, we feel partly blind to what's going on, though at the same time, I have to say that we understand why no, there is no idea of creating the one resource instead of all the databases. Then that's obvious. And uh, uh, the, the, the last problem, which is connected with uh, the fact that uh, we have the different resources, is also the fact that both the technical solutions and the law concerning all, each, of this, uh, the, the, each of these resources is developing uh, simultaneously but somehow independently one from another. So while we have the changes in one of the resources, we can have the effect on the searches which are done for the, for the other purposes, but we don't see immediately that the result of the change of the results 
is uh, the, the, so the, the reason for the change of the results is the change of one of the elements uh, which exist in such an ecosystem. So Teresa said that it's incredibly difficult, it, it's simply impossible uh, for the migrant to understand where the data is coming from. We, we, we simply, let's not talk about uh, difficulties, this is simply impossible. Uh, at the same time, it's almost impossible to understand it for those who are controlling, controllers of each of these resources, and those who are supervising, so the supervisors. And the main subject which we are trying to deal with is to understand the whole ecosystem and the relations which exist there. And we have to remember that uh, the, the uh, vocabulary of these legal acts also uh, changes, and I, I'm happy that there is no dis the, uh, predictive analytics uh, uh, discussed in neither of these acts, because if there was one, then I would have to understand what does it mean predictive analytics at all, and then what does it mean if we compare it with, with the legal ground for Eurodac or legal ground for uh, uh, for VAS system. So uh, the uh, work the European Union works on interoperability in public administration, shown that there is a technical aspect, a technical layer of interoperability. There is a semantic one, which we don't have either. Uh, there is an organizational, which we have uh, uh, big problems with. And actually, the legal and the political are probably the most transparent. So we just talked about like the fact, a certain disconnection uh, regarding the, the people that are affected uh, and um, the data protection supervisor as a, a function and the, 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 the complication that it uh, entails and the possible then like um, complication in overseeing also the respect of uh, human rights. Uh, I just want to invite also Ter Teresa, Sarah and Alina to share with us how they include our part of coalitions uh, of with people uh, that are directly affected by those uh, policies uh, and how it impact the work that they're doing. I can maybe come in quickly. Um, I think um, this is an enormous challenge and it's it, at the same time, it's so enormously important. Um, so I think that the challenge is exactly what we've heard a moment ago. This is so hard to understand and to articulate and to see really how all the different pieces connect um, that we just heard uh, the data protection supervisors speak of in terms of the institutional piece, the legal piece, these different legal frameworks which are developing, continuing to be developed, some of them in parallel. Um, and then I think, again, the way this is operationalized, it's not always easy to tease out the impact of a given use of technology on a given individual. So I think there's enormous challenges in terms of getting our hands around what we're talking about, getting our hands around the impact. Um, and so, um, I mean, within our network, for example, PECOM's work, PECOM is a network that focuses on the rights of undocumented people, and the majority of our members work directly with undocumented people. And they have their hands full with um, the daily challenges confronted by undocumented people. And so getting their hands around interoperability and around data protection issues is really challenging for organizations that already are very often stretched. And so it's really important to, 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 to um, embed this in what it means for the individual. Again, this is increasingly the realities of the individual, but unpicking it is important and understanding where it's situated. Um, and I think that's an ongoing work for our network. It really is an ongoing work for our network. And we've um, benefited tremendously from working with other organizations um, uh, like Sarah's um, in learning from them um, and giving input where we can in terms of what's happening at the EU level and then bringing those conversations to our members and hearing from them. But also understanding that each of us, even, even as non-experts uh, in terms of the digital rights piece, bring an expertise on this broader context and this understanding 
of impact that goes beyond strictly privacy and that goes strictly goes beyond strictly data protection, and that I think may not have been particularly present in the whole run up to the interoperability regulations passage. So, I think we we need to see the the importance and the urgency of involving those who can bring those critical insights. Those are expert insights, even if the expertise isn't per se on the technology. But then we need to be very proactive in bringing them into the conversations about the technology itself so that they can engage, so that they can understand it's, it's, it's how it relates in a very practical way, um, even if a very complex way, um, to their daily realities and their rights on the ground. So it's an ongoing work for us in our network uh, and for us in our secretariat. It's challenging, um, but I think this work is so, so essential, and it doesn't happen by accident. It requires really thoughtful and proactive engagement on all, on all sides. Um, just very quickly, I, I never really engaged with people whose personal data will be stored in the system. I did work on different projects, get stakeholder meetings, conferences, I wrote articles in order to explain interoperability. But the problem is that it's so complex and that if you start with this is about third country nationals, people are not really interested. The general public, I mean, not people who are in this uh, in this uh, privacy camp or in those conferences, of course. But if you want to reach the general public and explain what the issue is and what are the consequences, it is it is extremely difficult, and it always boils down to this. Uh, I read in the chat this us and they, and this is I think this is extremely important to note that it's actually not because it also has its impact on, let's call it us, although of course uh, fundamental rights and the right to data protection applies to everyone in the EU, right? The charter applies to everyone who's here and whose personal data are being processed. Um, and what I, I'm, I recently uh, was doing a training for those who will process uh, the ATS applications. And what is very uh, important to note is that there are so many uh, unclarified rules and uh, competences and what are the roles of whom. And as has been mentioned, like if we look at EU LISA and Frontex, uh, there are so many um, difficulties in building the system and who is actually responsible to carry out, let's say, a data protection impact assessment, who is responsible to reply to data subject requests. And as Wojciech said, um, DPAs are then, in the end, responsible to supervise all the system. And this, how will this work out? DPAs are supposed to then uh, follow the data flows and not look at individual controllers, but look at the data and how they are being connected. And this needs to take place on, on different levels, on EU level, on national level, and there needs to be some kind of cooperation in order to uh, establish effective supervision. And if DPAs or if even the controllers do not know really what they are doing, because what we need to keep in mind is that the system is not yet operational and we don't even know whether it will work uh, because once being connected, uh, what happens to all the wrongful data in the systems when they are leading to wrong matches? So how will this supervision of this interoperable system actually then work in practice and how will supervisory authorities uh, inform and help individuals who are being stored in those systems in order to then enforce their rights? Sarah? I will, I will be quick. Um, I, I think that one particular challenge of looking at digital technologies, data protection in the migration context, and perhaps in any context, is that often the technicality of these issues is used to obfuscate or avoid the fact that these are at the, the core very political issues. They're issues of exclusion, violence, racism, control over people's day-to-day -day lives. And the technicality of these files is not just a reason for people to disconnect from these issues, for, for a reason that people do not feel that they can discuss them and be part of those discussions, but is also often used 
perhaps by policymakers, perhaps by the digital rights community, also to uh, distance them from the people that are most affected. And this is, I think, a challenge that we should be very aware of and we should confront head on. Only if we do this, only if we acknowledge this and try to sort of avoid falling into this cycle, will we be able to challenge these questions head on. Otherwise, we will get lost in technicalities. And um, in answer to your question, Laurence, what Edri is doing, again, is inc incredibly hard. What we've tried to do more and more is the first midway step, which is to engage and sort of not, not play into this notion that there is a very valid distinction between digital rights organizations and migration organizations, and rather that both types of organizations need to be connected on these issues. So I think the second step is actually how do you connect with people that are directly affected? And I do not want to say that we have been, been successful in that for many of the reasons and the barriers that we've talked about and sort of the bread and butter issues that Alina has spoken about, right? If you are at risk of a pushback, if you do not know how you're going to have access to public services, can you really have the time and patience <laughs> to speak with people in very complex terms about data protection and other issues? That's a real challenge. And I think the burden is on us is to find a concrete way to address that. Beyond also civil society, I think crucially it's the place of academia and of policymakers to directly develop schemes of how to include the perspectives of people affected in their work, to dedicate resources to do that, to compensate people for their time to do that and to provide mechanisms to ensure the safety of people in order to participate in those processes. Civil society can try to do it, but ultimately, if the policymakers who are making decisions and concrete uh, proposals for changes about people's lives do not feel that it's um, do not feel that it's appropriate to do so, we will be continue with the cycle of making policy about people as opposed to with people. And I think that's what we need to focus more of our energy on, especially on the topic of migration and surveillance technologies. Thank you so much. Those are great uh, words to conclude the panel. <laughs> um, and we're on time. I just want to flag that uh, some questions were asked in the chat, uh, and notably uh, by Romain Lano. And uh, Dave let the email address in case you wanted to uh, answer them uh, later on. Uh, those are quite precise and important questions. Uh, specifically regarding the fact of the legislation being uh, being more uh, centered on accuracy from a technical point of view uh, w rather than on fairness and uh, human rights protection of the people uh, impacted by this uh, by those uh, measures. Uh, I just want to invite Chloe uh, Bertolini from Edry back. And uh, want to thank you for the time and just, yeah, for the talk and the input. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Laurence, for moderating this great panel and to the speakers. That was actually a very interesting conversation. And I think just the start, uh, we only scratched the surface, I think. Uh, I would like to restate our um, big thank you to the, the EDPS for their continuous support over the years uh, of Privacy Camp. They're uh, joining forces with us every time, and this is a pleasure to have them uh, in a common discussion. And I hope we have more discussion in the future about these topics and other difficult ones where maybe we disagree, but we are on the same uh, side, um, hoping to find a solution to solve um, fundamental rights issues and, and, and problems. Uh, 